Our next speaker was born and largely educated in Pakistan and is now an associate fellow of the Asia program at Chatham House. She's written extensively on the history and politics of Muslim South Asia, and last year she published her new book, Making Sense of Pakistan. Unlike perhaps most Pakistanis, she does not believe that America is primarily responsible for Pakistan's problems. Rather, she says, the country's malaise is rooted in its history of conflict with India and in its enduring uncertainty over the role of Islam in public life. Ladies and gentlemen, Fazana Sheikh. Thank you, Richard, and thank you all for being here this evening. Taking part as the only woman on this all-male panel, I'm reminded of that memorable song by the soul singer James Brown, It's a Man's World. So I've decided to do what a woman does best. She provokes, but with serious intent, much as I do in my new book on Pakistan, whose apparently provocative arguments are grounded in serious scholarship. So continuing in that spirit, what I want to suggest today is that it is time for us to reassess and subject to critical scrutiny the common claim that the United States is primarily responsible for the problems that beset Pakistan, or that America's constructive engagement might hold the key to stability in Pakistan. Instead, what I want to put to you is that Pakistan's malaise and the roots of its instability lie in its history of conflict with India and in its un enduring uncertainty over the role of Islam in public life. Together, they have encouraged this country to embark on a futile quest to match India abroad while leaving it dangerously vulnerable at home to the appeal of Islamist groups. The key to stability in Pakistan, I believe, lies therefore not with America, but with Pakistan, and with its determination to make peace with India, while forging ahead with a new constitutional settlement at home that unequivocally rejects empowering its citizens on the basis of their perceived relationship to Islam. Now let me briefly elaborate by putting some of these points in perspective. Though Pakistan's current predicament is dire indeed, not least in terms of the cost exacted in human lives, we must recognize that the catastrophe it now faces is the outcome of decades of state policy executed by successive governments which enthusiastically rented out Pakistan's services and its prime geostrategic location to the highest bidder, namely the United States. Though far from equal in this relationship, what is worth noting, however, is that Pakistan also proved to be a wily partner in that it has successfully resisted the leverage of the United States by assiduously cultivating China, for example, even while using the United States to try and meet its objectives by equaling India on the battlefield as well as on the glo global stage. It is then in the context of Pakistan's rivalry with India that we need, I think, to judge the merits or otherwise of US intervention in Pakistan. And indeed, Pakistan's own part in encouraging that intervention. For even when such intervention was at its most damaging, as during Pakistan's alliance with the United States in Afghanistan in the 1980s, the gains, namely Pakistan's mastery over the execution of the dark arts of covert war against India in Kashmir, were judged by Pakistan to far outweigh the suffering inflicted on its own people. Which brings me to the present day. For while it is no secret that hostility to America runs deep in Pakistan today, that hostility and instability unleashed by it 
stems as much from anger against what America is doing, that is, causing the appalling loss of lives, as against what America isn't doing. And what America palpably isn't doing is taking on board its allies' concerns vis-a-vis -vis India. We must remember that in this transactional relationship of mutual dependence rather than mutual respect, the price for services rendered is all that's really mattered. And Pakistan has quite rightly concluded this time that America has given it a raw deal. One way to break this damaging nexus would be for Pakistan to engage directly with India and to fight its own battles rather than allow itself to use and be used by American power. But if Pakistan is to fight its own battles independently of American and other props, it must first clarify what it stands for. For Pakistan's capacity and willingness to meet the terrorist challenge at home and abroad cannot depend on the material support of its allies, whoever they may be. Rather, it will depend on the country's confidence to project an identity grounded in a clear vision of the state's vexed relationship with Islam, which I believe has left it prey today to deep divisions and vulnerable to the forces of extremism. Uncertainty over, over the state's precise relation to Islam has, I believe, greatly undermined Pakistan's capacity to confront the so-called existential threat now posed by militant groups in the country acting in the name of Islam. The state's ambivalence over Islam, reflected in its acknowledgement of a public role for Islam while refusing to accept its full implications, has, I think, given license to Islamic militants who now seek, on the face of it at least, to hold the state up to its professed Islamic standards. The way forward, I would suggest, is not as we continue to see today for Pakistan and its leadership to try and co-opt one or other variant of true or real Islam on which consensus has always and will always elude the country. Rather, what ought to be of immediate concern and high on the agenda is a new constitutional settlement for Pakistan that formally and categorically rejects any provision that would empower or grant privileges to the country's citizens on the basis of their putative relationship to Islam. This, I believe, is likely not only to strip Pakistan's religious hardliners of the moral high ground they seek to occupy today, and thereby also, of course, to restore to all citizens the equality to which they are entitled, but to clear up once and for all the question of what we in Pakistan are really fighting for. The answer to my mind is clear. The fight against terrorism in Pakistan is not a struggle for the defense of Islam, nor a war designed to pit good Muslims supported by the state against bad Muslims allied to the Taliban. It stands above all, as indeed it must, as a struggle for the survival of Pakistan against those who aim to subvert and to operate in defiance of its laws. Thank you.